you're in charge <laughs> so yeah so maybe uh, jyotsna you can start yeah. introducing so now i'll keep my videos off and mute it okay. and so uh, yeah okay Thank so you. good evening everyone and welcome to yet another webinar conducted by applied photonics initiative or api so api is a consortium of iic student chapters of professional society like spi osa osi and ieee so we regularly conduct technical events such as webinars workshops and outreach programs with an objective of providing a platform for the fellow members to interact and share their knowledge so i'm jyotsna and i'll be hosting this online event today so before we actually start i request all the participants to keep your mic muted during the presentation and all your doubts will be answered at the end of the uh, presentation and if you have any questions we also appreciate typing in the uh, chat box so with this uh, said let me invite or present before you dr olivier martin professor of uh, nanophotonics and metrology laboratory at the swiss federal institute of uh, technology lausanne or epfl and he'll be presenting on controlling light with plasmonic and hybrid meta surfaces so dr olivier martin is professor of nanophotonics and signal processing at the swiss federal institute of technology lausanne where he is the head of the nanophotonics and metrology laboratory and director of the microengineering section he conducts a comprehensive research that combines modeling with nano fabrications and experiments on plasmonic system with applications in nonlinear optics biosensing security features and optical uh, manipulation at the nano scale dr martin has authored um, 300 publications and holds a handful of patents and invention disclosures In 2005 he introduced the concept of an optical antenna which is now widespread in plasmonics in 2016 he received an ERC advance grant on the utilization of plasmonic forces to fabricate nano systems and between 2016 and 2020 he served as a director of EPL microengineering section and conducted with his colleagues major curriculum reforms he is also an associate editor to advanced photonics and frontiers in physics on behalf of everyone present here i welcome you sir you may please take over from here thank you very much and let me share my screen thank you for the very kind um, introduction i must say it's a, it's a true pleasure to be here and to participate in your activities of this uh, applied photonics joint network it's so important to network and to uh, share uh different well our views on our research application i also like that uh, your your uh, chapter has the applied uh, title i think that's very important in the end to try to put all these good things into good use and so today i'm going to share our research on um, plasmonic and hybrid uh, meta surfaces maybe some of you are not fully uh, familiar with the idea of plasmonic so let me let me you okay you you hear me yes okay so let me start by um, presenting my you know plasmonics in a nutshell in a very simple way which is actually based on light scattering by a small particle if you have a very tiny particle and we'll see a lot of nanotechnology during the presentation if you have a small particle you're going to describe it with its permittivity so the permittivity epsilon which is dispersive like all material but especially with metals we'll be working with metals so the permittivity depends on the wavelengths if you take this small particle and you illuminate it with some incident light compute the scattered field you can do that within the me theory which is a very simple way of uh, dealing with that and in this term here the amount of scattered light by the small particle there are two components The first one which is here actually has the size of the particle so the radius r if the particle is large obviously it's going to scatter a lot of light but it's the radius divided by the wavelengths so if the wavelength is actually very short you'll have a lot of scattered light and this term actually explains why the sky is blue and not when you look directly into the sun but if you look at the scattered light from the sky you'll have a lot of well there is a lot of things floating around let only just you know vapor particles all sorts of things 
and all these things they scatter light and this scattering is going to be especially efficient for the short wavelengths so that's why the blue appears strongly in the sky now, when we deal with plasmonic we actually don't deal with this first term we deal with this term so this term the permittivity uh, of the particle and you see it's the permittivity plus two here in the denominator so again, if you want to make a very strong scattering object, what you could do is to find a material such that this would go to zero. Dividing by zero is going to make things very large. And to do that, you would have to have a negative permittivity. And it turns out that the metals have, in the visible range of the optical spectrum, negative permittivities. You see here the permittivity of silver, these are experimental data by Johnson and Christie, and you see that for this wavelength range, the permittivity actually decreases, the real part of the permittivity decreases and is negative. So the condition here to have zero would be to have epsilon equal to minus two. So if I look here, minus two will occur at a specific wavelength around 350 <laughs> A nanometer. And if I look at the amount of light scattered by this small silver particle, I will see a huge peak of resonance at this specific uh, wavelengths where epsilon becomes in the order of minus two. This becomes zero and you have a lot of scattered light. Now, of course, uh, the peak of resonance is not infinitely narrow. And the reason for that is that we have also an imaginary part, which often we write as epsilon double prime. This imaginary part here is responsible for losses in the metal. And as a consequence, the peak here is going to have a finite uh, width. And actually, the losses can be quite important in metals. So this peak can be relatively broad. But the bottom line remains, OK, now we have uh, small silver nanoparticles, they have a strong plasmon resonance. We, we call that plasmon because we have a lot of free electron in these metals, like silver, and uh, it's like a plasma, uh, like you have in the fluorescent tube that maybe light the room where you're sitting, but instead of being a gas plasma, like in a fluorescent tube, it's a solid state plasma. You have basically the nuclei of the metal, and then you have the free electrons into this, uh, this solid background. So this small silver particle should actually have a nice strong blue uh, color. And when you have such a simple theory like that, it's of course important to try to make an experiment to verify it. We did that a while back when I was at UCSD in the US, and you see that these are 50 nanometer silver colloidal particle, and we see that indeed they are blue. But we also see many other colors like green, yellow, red. And to try to understand what was going on, because obviously our simple theory was not able to explain that, we resorted to electron microscope. So you have here on the left the same image as the image on the right. The right is an optical dark field image. On the left, it's an electron microscope. And if you magnify you observe that this particle, for example, which is nicely blue, is indeed a nice small sphere. But this particle here, which is green, turns out to be like a small platelet that is polygonal. And this particle here, which is red, actually is more like a triangular particle. So we have different shapes and therefore you have different uh, resonances. Now, of course, you're going to tell me, well, but this is ob obvious, this is trivial. We do optics. We know that if the shape of a particle changes, the optical resonances are going to change. You're right. But at the same time, you must keep in mind that these particles, they are much, much smaller than the wavelengths. So we have indeed this kind of geometrical optical effect but for particles smaller than the wavelengths. So it's not quite like an optical resonance. You know, if you make a resonance, like if you are in your bathtub and you would like to make a big resonance, so we, we would like to make a big wave, what you're going to do, you're going to start to move forth and back into your bathtub. 
and then you will make a long wavelength wave which will have a wavelength similar to your bathtub. If you just wave your hands around and make little wavelets, it's not going to be very efficient. So a good resonance normally should have a wavelength comparable to the size of the particle. And obviously it's not the case here. So, so there is more to that and uh, we'll, we'll discuss that also a little bit uh, further later on. The bottom line also remains that the uh, appearance of these metals, so these are silver colloidal particle and these are silver bars, of course, the bulk is very, very different in terms of response. Uh, we see this basically is almost white, so it uh, reflects all the wavelengths, whereas these little particles have different uh, optical resonances. So Plasmonics really studies these, re these resonances and tries to use it for different uh, applications. We can do that with some metals, but not with any metal. Actually, the metals that work well for uh, doing plasmonics are called coinage metals. So these are metals that have been used to make coins like gold, silver, aluminium, copper. These are metals that have a very, very strong interaction with the light. And the reason for that is that they have a lot of free electron. So again, we, we speak of this plasma effect. We have a lot of free electron, and that's why we can excite this electron gas very efficiently with light. Each metal will work in a different range. We have seen that silver works well towards the blue. Um, gold, which is often the metal of choice, works in the red or infrared. Aluminium goes all the way to the ultraviolet and copper somewhere in between. At this stage, normally, actually, it is, it, is, it is a tradition to say that, by the way, our ancestors, you know, they were putting little particles of gold in the glass paste when they were doing stained glass windows. And these small particles of gold would have this strong plasmonic resonance and uh, that would make strong colors and as a consequence, we can still today enjoy these very strong, lively colors. I'll come back to that at the very end of my presentation. But to start with, let me uh, dwell into nanotechnology, because we've seen we need to have very small particles made out of metal. So how do we fabricate these uh, structures? I'd like to share a, a recent paper that we have published that describes this and compares two techniques, two technologies for the nanofabrication of plasmonic nanostructures. The first one, which is actually usually the, the, the technology people used, uh, is based on a so-called liftoff that uses a positive photoresist. So we want to write a very small structures, so we have to write them with an electron beam. And in a positive resist, the regions that have been exposed to the electron beam, when you develop the resist, they go away. So if we want to write a structure with gold here and there, these two regions go away. And then we evaporate gold everywhere. And at the end, we do what we call lift off. So we just dissolve all this area and we are left with only the nanostructure on the substrate. You may notice that actually in that process, we use two photoresists. Uh, for that specific case, we use one that's called MMA, another one that's called PMMA. Actually, you can use combination of The photoresist with green is negative. It means that once it has been exposed, so these two areas have been exposed by the electron beam, the photoresist will stay here. Previously, you see the photoresist was going away where it was exposed. So it stays and it's very hard. We use uh, often a photoresist which is called HSQ. And in that uh, approach, we have first deposited the metal and then put the resist on top. And then we're going to mill away the structures, so we use 
iron milling. Uh, we cannot use reactive iron milling because uh, this is not possible for gold, but we just use iron milling with heavy ions like argons. So we bombard the entire system with argon ions and the metal is going to be eaten away here. It's also going to be slightly etched here, but less because it's protected here by this photoresist. So two different approaches. The first one lift off with a positive resist. The second one iron etching with a negative resist. How do the two compare? You see here a series of structures. For example, here a dipole antenna made out of two nanoparticles of gold, which has been obtained by etching, and the same obtained by liftoff. And you see that with etching, you can really control extremely well the small gap between the two particles down to a few nanometers, say five to 10 nanometer. Here it's much more difficult. Also, the structures that you obtain with liftoff are often a little bit larger and, and, and a little bit rounded. This is because the metal here on the surface of the substrate can diffuse because this bottom layer is a bit larger. So this defines the uh, outline of the structure less well. Here we have so-called dolmen structures. You see they are very well defined here with the etching. We can e even do some something like a small spiral here. It's very difficult to do that with liftoff. So overall, I think this etching approach is more controllable and allows you to control very, very small features very well. Now let's go back to what we have to play with when we do plasmonics. So we have only a few of those metals like uh, gold, silver, I think they are the two main metals, which means that it's difficult to get a plasmonic effect at any wavelengths. So a question we ask ourselves recently, and actually it's one of my uh, Indian PhD students who asked that question, and she was very, very clever and very awake, and she said, but actually, couldn't we extend the range of available plasmonic metals? And her idea was to actually try to work with alloys. So instead of working, and here I show you again the real part of the permittivity, which is negative, here you see the permittivity for gold, and here in gray, the permittivity for silver. Now, it turns out that if you would make an alloy, say 50% gold, 50% silver in green here, you would have a permittivity that would be in between. And if you would make a different stoichiometry, like 20% gold, 80% silver, you would have another value of the dielectric function. So, it seems indeed that by doing alloys, we should be able to vary the frequency where we have our plasmonic effect. Now, there is, of course, a problem because when we do alloy, say gold silver alloy, we perform the alloying at high temperature. And what we want to do are nanostructures. And the question is well, can we actually do nanostructures by heating uh, our alloy? And if you take an example, this is a small uh, bars that we've made out of the alloy. We have heated to make the alloy, and you see that after alloying, you've lost the shape of your structure. You just have a, a small blurb that is not so well defined. So DebData had this idea of developing a technology where we could actually keep the structure and still make a good alloy. So that was quite a challenge, and the idea is to find a low temperature alloying process. So what uh, we came up with was to do a very long alloying. Normally alloying is relatively short, you heat and then the alloy happens and then you can cool down. But what she did was to alloy for eight hours and at a relatively low temperature, only 300 degrees Celsius. It turned out that the alloy was quite goodly formed after that time, but a little uh, push at a slightly higher temperature, so 450 for 30 minutes, would then make it very, very well alloyed, as I will show you in the next slide. 
Now, the interesting uh, feature of this approach is that you can do any alloy by just adjusting the thickness of the metals you, de you deposit. So say you, you want to do gold 80%, silver 20%, you put 80 nanometer of gold, and then you put 20 nanometer of silver, and you alloy and you get this stoichiometry. If you want to do 20% gold, 80% silver, you put 20 nanometer of gold, 80 nanometer of silver, you alloy, and this is what you get. And furthermore, the shape is perfectly well conserved. You see here, before annealing, we tried here to make tiny uh, triangular particles because they're interesting for plasmonics. After alloying, we, re we keep the shape very well. We can make high aspect ratio particles like these guys that are very long. They have an aspect ratio of five to one, pretty much. The length is five times the width. And you see that after alloying, we get a very good uh, the, the shape is very well maintained. We did also this system with four bars that have final resonances, and you see again very, very uh, nice shapes after the alloying. We wanted, of course, to check is it indeed alloyed or not? And that's, of course, the most important. So we did EDX, and you see here in the EDX map that we have, indeed, everywhere on our sample. Uh, this distribution of gold and silver, but also by doing XPS, we were able to go through the depth, so from the surface down to the substrate. And you remember that, uh, if I go back a little bit, we start with a sample that would be, for example, just silver on the top, gold on the bottom. But once it's being alloyed, we have a perfect mixture of 20% gold, 80% silver, throughout the entire sample. So we, we can indeed uh, fabricate nanostructures that are well annealed, annealed through the entire uh, depth of the material and uh, that retain their shape. So of course the question, well, that's already nice in terms of fabrication, but the question is, well, can, can that be actually useful? So one of the use we found was to do metasurfaces. Let me maybe explain a little bit about metasurfaces. Again, they are related to these uh, resonances. I've mentioned that here, when I have a small silver particle, I have here a peak in the scattering of the particle. I have here a peak and I have a strong uh, resonance there. Um, well, actually, let me try to do an experiment because that's, you know, it's end of the week. You may be all very tired listening to me. So I'll let me stop sharing and let me, oops, start my camera again and do an experiment. This is a very simple experiment. You see, I'm having a mass and a spring. And now this spring, of course, obviously has a resonance. What I'm going to do first, I'm going to go up and down with my hand. So I go up and down with my hand. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, you're not visible right now. Can Don't you... you see my, I see myself, I see my camera. Uh, uh, yeah, now I think it's appearing. Yeah, now it's fine. Can you, yeah. Okay. Now it's... So oh. here I am. <laughs> If you put the focus on me, so I have here a mass and a spring, and I'm just going with that spring up and down. So what's happening is that when my hand goes down, the mass goes down, and when my hand goes up, the mass goes up. Nothing very exciting, sorry. But I'm going now to go at higher energy, so I'm going to go at higher frequency. And I'm actually going through the resonance of the spring. And now you, you probably don't really see it very well, but I can assure you that when I am at higher frequency than the resonance of the spring, when my hand goes down, the mass goes up. And when my hand goes up, the mass goes down. So let me go back to my slide and share again my uh, presentation. So what's happening here? We have this resonance, that's the resonance frequency. 
And when I was at lower frequency, when my hand was going down, the mass at the bottom was going down. When my hand was going up, the mass at the bottom was going up. Now, if I change the frequency and I go at high frequency, so higher than the resonance frequency of the spring, then it's the opposite. So when my hand goes down, the spring, the mass goes up. And conversely, when my hand goes up, the spring goes down. So what has happened is that as we were going across the resonance of the spring, there was a phase that was appearing. You see, at low frequency, we were in phase between the excitation and the response between my hand and the mass. But when we go to high frequency, we are out of phase. So there has been a phase difference of pi. Now, what's interesting is that this phenomenon occurs for a spring and a mass, but it also occurs for a particle. If I go back to my small silver particle and I do light scattering by this particle, if I go at low frequency, lower frequency than the plasmon resonance frequency of my particle, the scattered light is in phase, you see it oscillates in phase with the excitation. If I go at high frequency, for, for example, now I would use a shorter wavelength light like blue, you see that now the scattered light is out of phase compared to the excitation. So by using a nanostructure, I'm able to have a system that scatters the light in phase or out of phase with the excitation. And phase is actually the key mechanism, I would say, behind any optical element. There is, of course, a, an archetypical optical element, which is a grating. When you have a grating, light comes at normal incidence, and then it is deviated. So it means that if we look at the lines of the phase front, you see this phase front arrives here, and then it continues like that. But if I go a bit further along, there is like a jump, because the phase front has to move. And if I go a bit further, it, the jump is even larger, until I reach a point where it's going to be the next phase front that arrives. So we say that a grating, it builds a phase gradient along its surface. Here, the phase that is added to the incoming uh, wave is zero, and here it's two pi because it has jumped by this factor, and so on and so forth. But it's a, the same is true for a lens. If you think about it, a lens, it takes a plane wave like that, and these phase fronts are going to be focused on one point. So you're going to bend the phase front, which means that here on the left you have added a phase of pi, and here you have subtracted a phase of pi, and this makes the ray bent such that they focus here. And of course the most general case would be the case of a hologram. If you have a hologram on the surface, you have a very complicated distribution of the different phases such that you can create here the hologram. So <clears throat> the idea is, can we mimic this effect of a grating or another optical element by now, instead of having just this periodic structure, we will put different plasmonic alloys with different stoichiometry such that they will produce different phases on the surface. So this is what we did. We made uh, nanos, well, samples where we had a combination of different materials. Uh, the, the, the technology is as follows. It's basically a lift-off approach. You start by putting your photoresist, you do the e-beam exposure, and then you deposit all the structure that would have, for example, 20% um, gold, 80% silver. So you put 20 nanometer gold, you put 80 nanometer silver in these regions. But then we want to have a mixture with some other structures. So you start again, you put again photoresist, and now you expose again other regions of your sample. So there is a relatively tricky E-beam alignment that needs to be done. And here we develop, for example, having developed, we deposit here 
say the other stoichiometry, so 80% gold, 20% silver. We do the lift off, so we remove the photoresist. We are left with all our nanostructures, and then we do the annealing. And some structures have been produced with 20% gold, 80% silver. It's these ones, for example. And other structures have been produced with 80% gold, 20% silver. It's these ones. So that, that's, of course, the theory. This is the sample, how it looks like. You see all these different structures. Here we've just made small dots. If you look a bit closer, you'll tell me, well, actually, they're, they're nice. Your dot, they are typically 80 nanometer in diameter. But you will tell me, well, actually, they're not so well aligned. And actually, you would be right to say they're not so well aligned. But you must realize that half of them have been done in a successive step. So if you color the sample, this is what you have. You have some structures that are 20-80% gold-silver and other structures that are 80-20. So they have been written into successive uh, e-beam steps. And then we measure that. So with that we've made, for example, a hologram here. You have a hologram of our logo. Or here we've made a lens and you see the focusing of this lens which is actually very good. I mean, it's uh, you end up having really something which is uh, diffraction limited. To make a lens, then you have to organize all your nanostructures in concentric uh, circles from the center of your of your plate. So, so this is like a Fresnel zone plate, if you like, but for for visible light and made out of different uh, stoichiometry. So this was our uh, alloyed uh, plasmonic nanostructures and metasurfaces. I would like now to move on to something which is both relatively theoretical and experimental, because again we've done we've done the fabrication. Uh, it's also an experiment where we had to resort to using silver as a very strong um, plasmonic material. Let's go back to the basics. If, if you and, and this is all related to these uh, meta surfaces and a lot of discussion that have occurred probably uh, 15 years ago when people started to think about magnetism at optical frequencies. And if you go back to Landau and Lifshitz, for example, their book will say, well, actually, no, magnetism is not possible at optical frequencies. Because at optical frequencies, the current have to go very fast. They have to go at the optical frequencies, so hundreds of terahertz. And if the current goes so fast, then they will dissipate all the energy and it will be not possible to make of current. I think this opinion has been a little bit revised. And then I think there is a consensus. Yes, you can do magnetic effects but we don't have magnetic material to make these effects. So you can do magnetic effects by engineering the spatial distribution of the electric permittivity. We don't have a magnetic permeability. And of course, a material that interacts with light very strongly, like plasmonic material, is a good candidate for doing that. But unfortunately, when you do a nanostructure out of a plasmonic material, usually its electric response is going to be the dominant one. So let me try to explain this with this uh, computation here. We have a little U-shaped particle which is made out of silver, which we illuminate and we looked at the scattered light, so the cross-section of that uh, system. The scattering cross-section is given in black with the dot. Now we can decompose this scattering cross-section, so the amount of light, in different modes that exist in the system. One that you probably know if you do electrical engineering, which is the electric dipole. If you have a small antenna, it's going to radiate like an electric dipole. And this electric dipole appears here in blue. We have here an electric quadrupole, which, is, which appears in green, and we have also a magnetic dipole that appears in pink. 
And actually what I would like to find is a structure where I have only a magnetic response, a very strong magnetic response. So somewhere where basically I have only this pink curve. But when I said that normally the electric effects dominate, you see it here, maybe I can zoom a little bit. You see that here, most of the scattered light is actually electric light because it's the electric dipole that dominates. And the magnetic dipole is only very tiny. It's just this little peak. So our objective is, can we make a structure where we would have only a magnetic response? To do that, we thought, OK, if we have a single bar of silver, for example, then it, we can excite a resonance. And this resonance, actually, we can observe it by looking at the charges. And the charges, the blue and the red, it means that when the light comes on this small particle, it's going, the, the electrons are going to oscillate. And if the electrons go all on one side of the particle, on the other side, you will have a lack of electron that would appear like a positive charge. And then half a period later, it's the opposite. See, if we have one single particle which has this mode, this is what we get. But if we put two particles together, we can now have the two particles either oscillate in phase. So you see it's blue and red, blue and red. And this is like, again, looks like an electric dipole. But we can also have them oscillate in opposition of phase, huh? red, blue, blue, red. And this starts to look a little bit like a small loop of currents, so like a magnetic mode. In order to have this effect, we need the light to hit this guy first and then this one. So we can do that by coming at an angle. If we come at an angle, the light will first hit this particle and then that particle. And as a consequence, we're going to have this type of a loop current. So if we come at normal incidence, we will just have them driven together and we'll have this resonance. And, and we see it here at normal incidence, we have a narrow resonance. But if we come from 45 or minus 45 degree, we have a broader resonance. These are calculations, these are experiments with actually a very good agreement uh, between the two. Now, if we make this decomposition of different modes, again, I show you here for normal incidence and at 45 degree, like on my very first slide, the different modes, the electric dipole, the electric quadrupole, the magnetic dipole, we see that these modes start to play some role, but still the one that's dominant is the electric dipole. There is another way to look at these uh, modes decomposition, which is to use these little uh, squares here. The electric dipole is actually a vector because the dipole could be in X, Y, or Z direction. Here we have a strong dipole in X direction because the field oscillates in X direction. We could also have a magnetic dipole. You see again, it's a vector with three components. And we could also have an electric quadrupole. And the electric quadrupole is a bit more complicated because it has nine components. It's a tensor. If we come now at 45 degree, where we start to see a little bit of electric quadrupole in green and magnetic dipole, we see that indeed these have been slightly populated, but it's still the electric dipole that dominates. Huh? If, we, if we do the analysis of the light in that system, most of the mode that's excited is an electric dipole. So we need to try to increase this retardation effect. One way of doing that is to change our geometry and have now one of the bar smaller than the other. If we change the length of the bar, we change its resonance frequency. And as a consequence, if we change the resonance frequency, we're going to change the phase between the two bar. And we see also that actually the response of the system becomes a bit more complicated. Again, a good agreement between the simulation on the left and the experiment. When we try now to understand what's going on, what we observe here is that we have managed to get rid of this 
dipole at 45 degrees. We see here the electric dipole goes to zero, but we start to also have a bit of magnetic response. So the magnetic dipole, which corresponds to a loop of current, and the current is rotating along an axis which is in Z direction. So we have a bit of magnetic dipole, but we still have quite a bit of electric quadrupole. I would like also to mention here that I think there has been a lot of confusion when all that started about uh, 15 years ago between a true magnetic dipole, which is a true loop of current, and an electric quadrupole, which is still an electric mode, but which, is, which has some similarities with the loop of current. But we will actually see that on the next slide. So our objectives remains to have only a magnetic resonance and get rid of this resonance here. So the reason why we have now these two uh, modes present is that because they are degenerate. And here I show you really uh, the difference between the two. This is really a magnetic dipole. It's a complete loop of current. Uh, the current goes around your structure like that. We has an electric quadrupole. It, it's almost a loop of current, but you see it goes and it pulses back and it comes and it pulses back. So it, it, it feels it's almost a loop of current, but it's not quite a loop of current. These two modes occur at the same energy in that system. We need to remove this degeneracy, and we can do that by actually cutting each bar into two. So if we cut this bar in two and we cut the right bar into two, now we have these two modes which occur for different polarization. When the excitation is in the plane, that's what we call a transverse electric polarization, the current here in blue will push the charge like that, and in red will push them back, and that will make a loop of current. Whereas if we come with transverse magnetic illumination, you see that it's going to be pushed and back, pushed and back. So this is the magnetic dipole I'd like to achieve. This is the electric quadrupole. If we do the measurement, this is what we get here with the simulation. And if we look at the decomposition of this system, we see that we have now essentially a very, very strong magnetic dipole. So with that strange system made of four little bar of silvers, here the scale is 100 nanometers, so they're very tiny, coming at an angle, we have actually achieved at this specific wavelengths a situation where the electric dipole in blue, the electric quadrupole in green, both of them have vanished, and I'm left with only a magnetic dipole here uh, in purple. So I've been able to produce pure magnetic light. Again, good agreement between experiment and simulation. If we look at the way this uh, system is going to radiate, like a magnetic dipole, so there is the vertical z-axis and the current flows around, we see that it radiates relatively homogeneously. So if you look at the sample in an optical microscope, this is what you should observe. You should observe something like a ring like that. And if we do the experiment, this is indeed what we observe. We use a measurement setup in reflection, so that's the reason we had to block here this uh, element. But you see, indeed, we observe that we have achieved experimentally light that radiates like that, uh, like a magnetic light. This was controlled by the polarization. This was for the transverse electric polarization, where we create this mode. If we use the other polarization, it's not the case anymore. We have now all the modes that are excited, the electric quadrupole and the electric dipole that become dominant and very little magnetic mode. So by, by engineering your nanostructure, it's possible to uh, suppress specific modes like electric resonance and have only magnetic resonance. There is another way to do that, and that will be my last uh, uh, topic here. I'm going to talk about hybrid surfaces. So what do we mean by hybrid surface? 
Well, we've seen that plasmonics, they are very good and they mainly support these uh, electric dipole resonance. Now, if instead of using a plasmonic metal, I would use a dielectric material, like a small dielectric cylinder, these dielectric cylinders, they support other type of modes, like quadrupole, octupole, they have very, very complicated electromagnetic modes. So our idea was actually to combine the two and to make a hybrid system. So a nanostructure, which has one part which is dielectric, and here we are going to use silicon because silicon has a high refractive index of three, so we'll have a lot of modes. And then on top of that, we're going to have an aluminium plasmonic system, which is just going to be an aluminium disc. And by controlling the spacing between the two, we can control actually the interaction between these different modes. So we fabricated these systems. You see them here. Uh, actually, we managed to fabricate them on a very large uh, area. Uh, the diameter is about 300 nanometer and uh, the height also 200 for the silicon, about 60 nanometer for the aluminum and the spacer we have also varied. The fabrication is quite interesting because it combines the two techniques I've presented at the very beginning. You remember I told you about liftoff and etching. And here actually we, we do both. We start with our substrate, then we put photoresist. So, sorry, we start with our substrate, then we put the silicon, which is going to become the cylinder. Then we put the photoresist for liftoff. So we put two different photoresists on top. We do the e-beam lithography, and then we deposit aluminum disc. So we have here a small aperture of inside the photoresist, and then we deposit aluminum and we make liftoff. So by doing that, we have a small disc of aluminum which sits on top of our dielectric structure. In that case, the dielectric structure uh, contains at the bottom in blue the silicon and even, for example, the glass spacer. And this little disc here of aluminium is going to become our plasmonic structure at the end, but it's also going to be our mask for etching the structure. And so we want to make a cylinder. We start with a disc of aluminium, and by doing etching, in that case, we do reactive ion etching, and we remove the silicon and the glass, so the green and the blue uh, parts here. And in the end, we end up having our structure fabricated like that, which you see again here. So obtained through etching, dry etching of our sample. So if we have just, if you look in terms again of the different modes, we see here the electric mode, the magnetic mode that we have in the system. If we have just the aluminum disc, it's not very interesting. It's mainly an electric dipole. If we have, on the other hand, the silicon cylinder, here it's much more interesting. We have a lot of modes that exist. Uh, again, an electric dipole in blue, which dominates, but we also have magnetic dipole that can occur in this dielectric structure. And then when we combine the two together, we really have a very, very complicated uh, spectrum with many, many different features that come from the hybridization of these different modes. So I'll try to keep the story relatively short. This is a measurement of this sample, and you see these different spectral features that you see here that we have uh, highlighted with dots. Now, in those measurements, we have actually changed the background of the liquid around the structure. You see, we started with air, then we put water, and then we added some glucose to the water to increase the refractive index. So we go from the index of water, 133, to that of water plus a bit of sugar, 140 or 144 with more sugar. And this is the principle of biosensing with plasmonic structures. When you do biosensing, you look, you monitor the shift of the different resonances as you 
increase or change the, refract the, the, the background refractive index. And so you see that these different spectral features, they move as you change the background. We actually quantify this sensitivity by saying how much um, spectral change, so how many nanometer in this peak when I change the background by one refractive index. So the sensitivity here is expressed in nanometer per refractive index unit. And we have here four features, and each feature has its own sensitivity. Uh, feature number two, it's this one here, the orange, is the one that has the strongest sensitivity, which is in the order of 200 nanometer per refractive index unit. So if I change the background by one refractive index, one unit of refractive index, the resonance changes by 200 nanometer. We were pleased to notice that. At the same time, we realized that actually it's not so fantastic. Uh, if we had used a very good quality dielectric resonator, like what people do in silicon, they managed to get a sensitivity of 300. And if we had just used a pure plasmonic nanostructure, you end up having a sensitivity of 600. So this structure is very complicated to do and it doesn't perform so well as a biosensor. Um, one reason we discover is that when you look at the structure here and you look at the field distribution, you notice that the field is strong in this dielectric spacer. But the liquid we want to measure is outside. So of course, that's not going to be very efficient. So we thought, okay, maybe we can here etch a little bit of the spacer. Like this, we can have the liquid access the strong field. And this is what we did. We did an additional step of wet etch to produce this uh, undercut. And you see it here in this colored image. So on top, you have the aluminum. Aluminum is very grainy. It's not very, well, it's hard to use as a plasmonic metal, but it doesn't matter too much. It has a lot of grain. Here we have the glass spacer that has been recessed. It's been etched away. And here we have the bottom with the silicone. So with that, we performed the gain measurement and we had some improvement, but not so much because we reached only 245 nanometer per refractive index unit. Okay, so let me come to the end. I told you that when we, we talk about plasmonics, we often say, well, our ancestors, they were putting little uh, uh, particles of gold into the glass paste when they were doing stained glass window. And these support plasmon resonance and make these very nice colors that we can still enjoy today. Is it true? Is it a myth? Uh, well, we are privileged because not far from where we are, there is a center for stained glass windows. It's an amazing place which is full of old, very ancient bits and pieces, lots of cardboards with samples from all around the world. And we were able to put our hand on this little tiny bit of stained glass window, which comes from the Minster of Ulm in Germany, which is from the late Middle Ages and has very, very pretty stained glass window. So we thought, okay, it has a nice reddish color. That must be gold nanoparticles. And we cut a little bit of the sample. We see here there is indeed some thick layer that has some coloration. And we wanted to work out, is this actually gold? So we did EDX analysis and we looked for gold or possibly silver and we found absolutely none. So we were very disappointed, but we found something else. We found copper. And if you look at the density, the distribution of this copper through the depth of the structure, there is a very good correlation between the density of this copper nanoparticle and the color of the image. And copper is a plasmonic metal, but copper is not so much used nowadays as plasmonic metal because the losses are quite important. But it seems that in the Middle Ages, they, our ancestors were putting copper in the glass paste. The particles are about 60 nanometer in diameter. They are extremely dispersed. Huh? So from one particle to the next one, you have almost four micron. 
But nonetheless, it's probably this small copper particle that produced the color. To, to check that, uh, we looked at how we perceive color. You probably know that we have three types of uh, receptor in our eye that have different sensitivities that are shown here. One in the blue, one in the green, and one in the red, and also a little bit in the blue. And any color that we perceive, we can show in this diagram here by projecting the color over these uh, three coordinates, and that gives us a point here into this diagram, which we call also the color gamut. So you can do that. You can take 60 nanometer copper particles. You can calculate the response, the extension, scattering, absorption. From this spectra, you can calculate the color, and this is what we get as a color, which is actually in a very good agreement with the color we observe. So as a matter of fact, our ancestors were doing plasmonics. They were using plasmonic metals, but it was not gold. It was copper. So this brings me to the summary of my presentation. I've uh, given you a bit of an overview of our recent activities. Nanofabrication, different approaches for nanofabrication. I think etching is something that should be used more uh, regularly because it performs extremely well. We've looked at trying to find new plasmonic metals. And one idea is to use alloyed nanostructures, so mixture between gold and silver. And with that, we can do meta surfaces, we can do meta hologram, we can do Fresnel plates. We've gone back to some very fundamental physics based on the uh, optical resonances and whether they are more electric or magnetic type. And finally, some hybrid metasurfaces, which I think uh, could be very useful in the future. It's something that has been around for a few years, but there has been very few experiments because very few have been fabricated. So I think that's an interesting technology and probably we'll see more of that in the future. Of course, all that is only possible because I have a fantastic team of people who were very important for that uh, talk was Deb Data. She's here. Um, Christian also for the technology, Xiang Xiu for the meta surface, Gabriel for the theory, and uh, all of them. Of course, you'll find the papers on the website, nandophotonics.ch, and if you have the slightest questions or would like the slide, just uh, let me know. I'll be very happy to answer. So that's it. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, sir, for this very informative and detailed session. So uh, now let's move on to question and answer session. So if any of you have any question, please unmute yourself and ask. Hello, uh, can I ask a question, Josna? Yeah. Yes, so hello, Professor Martin. This is Ambarish. And uh, firstly, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, thank you so much. I have two questions. Uh, my first question is related with your alloying technique. Um, if I were to co-evaporate the two materials with some ratio, and uh, would I be able to get the same dielectric constant function uh, compared to a, a more elaborate alloying procedure? Um, yes, th that's a very interesting point. Of course, if you are able to co-evaporate then you would still need to alloy at the end. Huh? So say you co-evaporate gold and silver in the right proportion, then you still need at some stage to heat the sample to uh, obtain an alloy. I think so what we show here is that you would be able to co-evaporate and then heat, but not too much, using this type of uh, recipe. And therefore, you would be able to make nanostructures with arbitrary shape in different alloys. So we don't have a machine where we can co-evaporate. This is why we evaporate successively. But you're perfectly right. I think you could co-evaporate. And then if you want to make strange shape, you, you need not to heat too much. Otherwise, you'll just have spheres. So you could use this technique after co-evaporation. Another approach, of course, would be to have a target with the right stoichiometry. But this is very expensive. So say if you want to do 80 
percent gold, 20 percent silver. If you have a target for your evaporation machine, which has this stoichiometry, normally if you use that as a target, you would be able to deposit directly the alloy you, you, you need. But for each stoichiometry, you need a different target. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I have a second question, and this is related with your uh, wonderful uh, experiments on magnetic light. I mean, I understand that the main uh, proof that this is a magnetic dipole is coming from the angular dependence of your scattering. Um, now, is it possible to think of any other way of finding um, the, the magnetic nature? For example, is there any spectroscopic signature uh, that you can think of for this? So there are probably different answers. Uh, here we can look at this. So if I take spectroscopy in, in the way we do it, very simple on nanostructures, we have here the spectrum of these uh, structures and, and, and we see some feature which agree well with our simulation and uh, uh, as a matter of fact uh, we know from this analysis that here we have mainly magnetic light. But I think you are also pointing towards something much more interesting which we have not quite done which is we know that, for example, we have uh, most electronic transition, they, they are uh, electric dipolar in nature but there are also transitions that are dipole forbidden. So yes. indeed, if you were to put molecules or maybe cold atoms on that system, you could probably observe some, some interesting effects and, sudden, and, and, and there you would have a, a spectral signature uh, in that system, which would be really the, the the result of having a pure magnetic light. So this is extremely fascinating. Uh, we've not done it. Um, if you know how to do it and you'd be interested to collaborate on that, I'd be of course uh, thrilled to do that because I think that would be a way of, of using this type of uh, pure magnetic systems. Um, actually, I was very specifically thinking about uh, not only on and out transitions, but also chiral effects, because all sorts of chirality induced effects have both electric and magnetic components. So whether the chiral signature will get enhanced in these structures at these wavelengths is basically what I was thinking of. Okay, this I don't know. This is something we, we are also a bit interested by chirality, and uh, there are these works in which, which seem to indicate that... Um, you can define this chirality locally, as far as I understand. And unfortunately, usually when you have strong chirality in a system, like a metasurface or structure, the field is very weak. And as a consequence, the chirality is not at all uh, enhanced. So I don't know. You you, this is possibly a very interesting idea to look into that more specifically. We've not done it. Uh, but but it could well be that chirality could be enhanced in those structures. Although if I look at their shape, they doesn't really seem to be very chiral. But but I think chirality maybe we have looked at it with a two one mindset, and maybe we should indeed look a bit sideways. And uh, what you propose is possibly very interesting. Yeah, I don't know the answer, but it's very interesting point indeed. Yes. Okay, I'll think about it. Thank yes, you. Thank please. you so much. You and so let much. me know what you find. Sure, sure. <laughs> I will do so. Thank you. Are there any more questions? No. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh -huh. Hello? Hello? Yeah. So uh, I wanted to ask... Uh, what is so special about pure magnetic light as opposed to the normal uh, electric light from the point of view of applications? Like, uh, is well, there something uh, specific application that only pure magnetic light can uh, can be applied to? So that 
I think um, your colleague mentioned a few interesting directions one could try to apply it. I must say so far we were really so pleased to be able to achieve it uh, that we've not really looked into application. But it's true that personally I was thinking that these uh, electronic transitions that have their own specific rules, which also depend on the type of uh, light you have, could be quite uh, interesting to look into. Um, but but there, there, there might be some others. It, it does remain, of course, uh, a relatively uh, fundamental topic uh, that, that we're trying to go back to Lando and lift sheets. I think per se, being able to have magnetic effects at optical frequency is, is quite interesting because normally it doesn't exist. But um, beyond what we've just discussed, so possibly chirality and uh, forbidden transition that would then become allowed, this is, uh, this is all that comes to my mind. But maybe you have more idea and uh, you would find something useful to do with it. Okay, so thank you. So we have one question in the chat box. It's from Lal Krishna. So I'll read out the chat. Thank you, uh, Professor Martin, for an excellent presentation. I would like to know if there is any intuitive way to understand the reason behind dipolar response from metal nanoresonators and multipolar responses from dielectric counterparts. Another doubt is the hybrid in the hybrid system, supposed to have a dielectric holy disk on a metal disk for improving the light matter interaction. So, an intuitive way of understanding. The, the picture I make myself when I look at this uh, small disc made out of aluminium is I know, okay, I have a lot of free electrons. So if the light comes on that system, it's going to, well, because we just have the electric field of the light and we have the free electrons. So if the electric field goes one way, all the electrons move the other way. And then as the light is one phase, half, a, half a period later, it moves back. So, so the way I understand this, and I think that's the way you need to think about it, it's really that all the electrons, they move as a block. I have a block of electrons and uh, they move all together. So if they move all to one side of the particle, then the other side is going to appear positively charged. And if they move all the way back, it's going to be the opposite effect. And this type of oscillation is like a current that oscillates in the metal. So if we go back to uh, radio engineering, this is really like just an electric dipole that oscillates. For the dielectric particle or the dielectric cylinder, and it's true that if you look at the spectrum, we see that the strongest low energy mode here is the magnetic dipole. Um, I would understand that this is a dielectric system, so there is not so many free charges that I can move. But when I come with some excitation, some light, I create a lot of small dipoles in the system. And these dipoles all together, they will kind of start, um, they're not going to move, but it, they will create a motion of the response of the system, which is basically confined by the boundary of the system. And because here this system is round, it will create something which is reminiscent of a small loop of current, which is nothing else than a magnetic dipole. But, but this is a lot of hand waving, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. So, but, but that's the way I understand this. In one case, we have a block of charges that move forth and back and create a current. In the other case, we have all these dipoles that are confined within the cylinder, within the geometry, and this creates that response. Of course, the, the other uh, way of answering the question is just to look at the calculations here. We have indeed a dominant electric dipole for this aluminum disc, and here we have a dominant magnetic dipole 
for this uh, system here. But that that's as far as uh, that that's not very intuitive. I must uh, I must agree. Uh, may I ask one question just now? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so thanks, Olivier, for the very interesting talk. Uh, just one query about this your uh, this uh, work of Devdatta, what she was doing on this alloyed structure of silver and gold. Uh, during the alloying process, I was just wondering. I don't find any oxygen in your EDX results or uh, XPS, right? So the presence of oxygen is not there. Was it uh, purposefully taken care? Because silver is uh, notoriously can be it is oxidized, right? Yes. So uh, what was the uh, thing behind that uh, uh, it did not oxidize and gold silver with these ratios came up? So we, we had previous experience with silver and you're perfectly right to point that out that indeed silver is very annoying for that. Um, we have the impression actually that it's not so much the oxygen that's really a problem, but it's really the water, mm -hmm. uh, which then of course could lead to the oxidization of the of the silver. So we are always very careful in all these experiments to remove all water. We keep our substrate for months or at least weeks into nitrogen chamber, mm -hmm. and all the annealing experiments were done in an oven under nitrogen uh, atmosphere. So as much as possible, we avoid any uh, exposure to ambient conditions. Okay, uh, that's a very good point because indeed it would uh, otherwise um, ruin the experiment. Now, once you have made the alloy, I, I, I believe there is not so much space for uh, oxygen, and we have realized that actually. Uh, we can stabilize, and, and it's known by, by others also, we can stabilize uh, silver nanostructures by putting a little tiny bit of gold, and, and then it becomes very stable. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Sir, may I ask a question? Of course. Uh, so, uh, during this uh, annealing process for which the alloy will form out, so instead of like I was uh, wondering, uh, uh, to retain the shape of the structure, why don't you uh, anneal it with the presence of photoresist itself, like the photoresist will evaporate off or something like that? Uh, that? That's a very good idea. That's a very good idea. And of course, you can do that. Uh, the, the problem, uh, let me see if I go to this slide. So you can do that as long as you have only one type of structure. So you're right here, I could keep the photoresist and then alloy, and probably, probably it, it would retain the shape. Now, having said that, if you do it at the normal alloying temperature, which is more like a 700 degrees, it will probably uh, destroy your photoresist. The photoresist might melt as well. So actually, with this type of photoresist, probably the photoresist will melt and then the shape will not be retained. Yeah, sorry, I'm just thinking a lot. So I, maybe at the same time, and I keep thinking a lot, even if the photoresist would stay, uh, it could well be that um, the nanostructure here would just go to its uh, energy minimum and then it would form little spheres. Uh, where was it? I had this uh, here. If we heat too much, I think even if we have these rods within the photoresist and the photoresist is stable enough, I guess if you heat the entire sample, you will have within the open rectangular shape of the photoresist, you might probably actually in the end have a little sphere because that's what minimizes the, 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 the surface energy of the, of the metal. So, so probably um, it will be difficult to retain the shape even if you have a robust photoresist that, would, could, that could withstand the, the, the alloying. But, but I'm sure there are many other ideas around that you should think about, and that could be interesting to make uh, uh, original uh, nanotechnologies. Okay, so thank you very much. Any more questions? I think 
no so if you don't have any further questions i would like to call the question and answer session end i would again like to thank the speaker for this uh, your valuable time and all the participants for your participation thank you all thank you all for joining today and thank you for having me and if you have any question don't hesitate to contact